PowerPod. What is PowerPod? Well, I just pulled up this little bit from our pricing um, price list and it says that we have like three different ways of doing things. With the building designer suite for doing huge, big, multi-story frames, industrial frames, office buildings, hotels, all those sorts of things. And we can also go on a individual basis and buy a particular program <clears throat> such as the masonry or the timber or the um, RC detailing, all those. And in the middle between these two different extremes we have this power pad suite. So it's for doing either 15, 100 or 300 member frames and it incorporates many of the features of our bigger programs. So let's have a wee quick look at what the website says. So at the heart of it is our frame analysis and we can do integrated, fully integrated steel, concrete and timber design. It'll do BS and Eurocode design so we can switch between those two at any stage. And what's it include? Well, that's a quite a boring mundane list. We'll come back to that in a second. But we have, in theory, four different versions with the basic power pad, which allows you to do a 100 member analysis, but really it's 15 member steel and concrete and timber design. The most popular is the plus, which will do a 100 member frame analysis. We have also upped the size, so there's also a third edition for 300 members in steel and concrete, which is very, very popular as well. And finally, for those who are students, we do have a student version of the system. Now, if you want to try the software, please feel to request a 30-day trial. Just click on the button on the website. So, product range, light suite, and just come down to power pad. And then in you come and request your trial. If you're a student, you use the other link for student version because it will actually give you a different version and I'm logged out of that page on this um, server, so not to worry. So I said there's an easy way to explain all this and this is using something called Prezi. So if you get motion sick, I would look away now. So PowerPad, as I said, four versions. At the heart is our frame analysis, where we can do 15, 100 or 300 members. And that then links directly inside the frame analysis to steel design, timber design, connections and even can, uh, concrete design. We also have a specialist program for doing portals and you get a 15 member version of that for doing your three span portals or last or plastic design. And that, again, will link into the steel and the connections and even the concrete pads. We then have little simple beam designers. One to span, three span beams in steel, concrete and timber. So when you want to do that little lintel, you want to do that little simply supported beam, you would use the beam designers slightly quicker than using the bigger frame analysis. And then we have the standalone additional modules, which you can use. So you can do your masonry panels, your pile caps, your masonry and your reinforced concrete retaining walls and your composite beams with your um, steel deck and concrete. And then we have this final thing called the Office Tools and Calc Wizard. Some people think that's what PowerPad is. It's only a tiny little aspect of what PowerPad is. So it gives you templates and you can create your own, but it more importantly to us, gives you the access to Word and Excel for exporting results. So that is what PowerPad is all about. So press an escape, close that down. Okay, here we are. Master Series 2016-10 from the 6th of October and that is the most up-to-date version. And I'm going to go straight into Master Frame, the first program. So once you're inside the software, you don't actually see the, the, the power pad again um, directly because there isn't no 
physical program. It is our real programs, but with some limitations, as you will see, such as the 100 member limit. So we're going into the real master frame, not a separate version, but the physical real version. So these are typical master frame file or par pad files, a little timber purlin sitting at an angle, A frames, uh, an attic truss, um, some timber trusses. Uh, ground beams on piles so you can design your continuous ground beams in concrete with your torsion. Some simple plane frames, towers, multi-story. So in essence it's very powerful 2D with some 3D. This is right on the limit of the 3D at this extent because unless you go up to the 300 member limit this is the 100 member limit and then you know more industrial type lifting plants and that's actually a house that somebody was doing and an escape fire case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this frame and open her up and we'll see immediately steel and concrete, haunched members, hollow sections, let's zoom on in, cell form beams, all part of the one model. So First thing you'd want to do is to do some editing, and we have phenomenally powerful editing tools. If I want to create another member, to find a new member, I would just come along, and I choose where I want it to start at, so at 2.5. If I wanted it to start, say, and I find it easier sometimes just to work in wireframe, I want to hover there and say I want to come out 2 meters, sorry, 2. So it gives me my point at 2, and I can then come orthogonal, uh, uh, or I could go vertical and snapping, or I could come down bracing, or I could just say, you know, in this case, come out, that's it, and type in the value 1.225, and it will create that wee member. And I'll just do a couple of undos there. To get rid of that. Now I can also do projections so if I decide I wanted to use a timber member and I could take this member and I could hover over this, get it and then say I want it to be 1.8 meters at that 19.983 degrees and it's now a continuation of that. So we have those powerful tools and of course at any point I can then take it back in perpendicular. Whoops, sorry. I just undid it by mistake and now I'm going to redo it back in perpendicular. So, and if you draw the 3D you will now see that this is in fact a timber member inside my frame. We also have a multitude of sections. I mentioned some of the section sizes. If I look at my properties, my section sizes, we have all the built-in and in this case I'm looking at a concrete member. If I go to one of my steel members, this is actually a plate girder, so I wanted a very shallow but strong plate girder for whatever reason, um, height restrictions, um, I decided to go for a plate girder here. Um, over here I'm into an, a normal UB. So you have all your UBs, UCs, you have your flats and rounds, you have your European, your circulars, your rectangulars, your squares, your angles, uh, British angles and European angles, your old fashioned channels, your parallel fashion flange channels and I'm listing them all but you as a user would probably go in and say no I don't want to ever see those and those and those and take them out so you only see what you need to and you, as you can see for any of these members I can ask it to be castellated, I can encase it, uh, I can go for haunched, I can have concrete, I can have uh, a user section for something that's just totally from left ball park. So that's a wee bit of the section properties. Um, loading is also very straightforward. Um, member loading. And you'll see for any of these members that we have a couple of UDLs and a couple of um, on the frame. 
and here we have some UDLs and wind loading as well and things like that. So loading is very powerful, your normal loads, your partial fixities, tension and compression only members, very very useful for doing cross bracing. Um, you can add in point moments and things like that. Once you've got all your loading, the next thing you want to look at are loading cases and I have done my loading cases so give them some names and I'll see that I have got quite a few loading cases that's 16 cases, but you don't have to worry about those, although we do have combinations of loading cases all set up and ready to be used. In this case, if I went back to the cases, I could go in and use my automatic generator to say, I want these combinations, and off it would go using whether I wanted to use the A and B or just the 610 um, structural and um, loading cases and we can create all that with our notional horizontal loads into the system so it's a full powerful um, system it's not a little starter system you're getting all the features in master frame okay so let's just come out of this um, I'm actually going to open another copy of this the original, which I didn't mess around with, and I've already analyzed it. So output, you obviously have your normal tabular output, which is so boring, but you also have the more exciting graphical output, the, the, the thing that us engineers all understand. So just push it out a wee bit, bending moment diagram, so just scale that down a wee bit so I can see it and just give myself a wee bit more definition so we can see our continuation, continuous beams for our concrete frames and then our primary and our secondary beams in our steel area and of course everything is per loading case or you could say give me all the cases if we're looking at the flexion with geometry uh, we would demagnify the frame I think a wee bit and then we might look at what our X and the Z value of displacements, not at ultimate, but in this case at service. And we'll see our millimeters of 15 millimeter sway and things like that, and we can assess that. So that is a brief run through of the frame analysis engine. But that is the heart of the power pad. And from that, we can go directly without any transferring or anything into our steel design. So I can see, because I had to rotate at the frame, the purple members I cannot design, they're the concrete sub-members. I can see my main rafters with my restraint locations. I can see on the same members, my appendix G, and in this case we've decided to put a torsional restraint in at the end of the haunch, so we're checking the portion out to the end of the haunch and then from past the end of the haunch for appendix G, or in this case, since we're using the Euro code, we are in fact in appendix BB. Likewise, we can look at our columns, and for our internal columns, we can look at them in simple construction with the point loads, the shear loads coming in at the distance of D over 2 plus 100. And of course, like everything, you can offset your eccentricities and you can put in additional loading if you so want from something that you didn't include in the frame analysis. All exceedingly powerful and flexible and one of the nice things is this ability to automatically change your design it's not does it work no oh dear let's go back to master frame it is does it work no let's change it or well actually it's well in and we shouldn't be using as much steel so I can come down and find the first section that works as you can see I have a little problem there in that it works then doesn't work then works then doesn't work and that's due to the different weights. What I can do is I can just say auto size and it will come up to the first one in the list that works which means the 406 is the shallowest section would work and I can do the same auto design and a 533 is going to work slightly deeper but lighter and again if we changed our grade to 355 
we might get away with a slightly lighter section but in this case we're not deflection is actually more critical than any other component in our design here now everything's great but it's even better if we can print out our results so let's go to print design output uh, I'm not going to worry about changing sections I'm just going to include all this so I'm going to say include everything above point 95 and auto select so it's going to run down through all the checks and then it's going to highlight and isolate the ones that are very high in their unity value so just doing a quick check and it's highlighted I think about two and I would probably just take that one as well and maybe take a couple of appendix G's that one so three checks one two three I'm going to check and print out because they're the critical ones I'm first of all going to send out to my Word document because I have PowerPad, I have the, the Office tools I'm going to export that and then afterwards I'm going to export the tables and my Word document has reappeared and when I scroll back out I will see that all my output I had previously put out a little ge uh, geometry of the frame here's your design checks and there's your summary of your checks and I obviously put them in the wrong order but there we go there's my checks already out to my frame and it's actually giving you all the design checks because if you think about it this rafter here has got on your one two three four five six seven checks for the seven different portions but they're just in that table so that you don't get a lot of full page output so as your steel design again very simple very flexible very easy to use so I'm going to not save and the reason I don't want to save is so that I don't have to reanalyze but you know um, analysis of this size of frame is so quickly and you notice we're doing P delta and horizontal notional loads there if I just show you again you'll see that I've set up P delta and notional loads on these and I just say go so concrete so that's my second design program concrete design so I've got my little continuous beams front and back and you'll see they're all nicely curtailed and I can take any bar and I can move it to see whether or not it would work at a shorter length and the answer is yes it would but clearly you would probably decide to leave that one back where it was and move the bottom one in to the shorter curtailment point and you can go through again you can auto design and it's carrying the reinforcement through from one side to the other we have a bit of torsion and that is why we get these couple of sidebars in the frame um, because we didn't release the end so we're actually getting a bit of torsion kicking through um, on the frame in this case since it's euro code we're getting our tensile force with our shear drag along here and naturally you also have your shear capacity checks and you also have the full output for each of these members so coming back if I now want to look at a column very simply here's a little uh, 400 by 400 column and it works the reason I know it works is because everything is white we saw that and I didn't mention it in the other steel design it's gone blue it fails so I could get away with 12s all around there if I wanted to circular column I obviously can't get below two because I need six bars uh, minimum um, but I could possibly get away with 12s no I couldn't and if I have 12s I end up with my moment capacity under uniaxial and under uniaxial in the different loading cases being critical and I want to just increase that the links seem to be set at 12 I'll put them in as 8s at 150 so that's your beams that's your columns pad foundations again very straightforward you just click on them we have set up from our initial settings all our parameters such as our concrete grades what our safe working pressure is whether you want to consider passive pressure in our pads um, all that is set up for us 
and you can save that and bring it in from file to file uh, and have different types for ground beams and multi-story frames and things like that. So again the pads are now all working nice and neatly and it isn't a heavily loaded frame. If I come in here you'll see this side is a lot more low because it's carrying the load from the floor and you'll see now we're at 2.2 square um, pad at 450 deep but we don't need much we only need our 16s at 300 as our bottom steel so again we can print all that out to the printer and I'll just save time by not doing that I will create a file and send it to everybody afterwards a word document file but uh, what I will do is I'm going to export the details that I have drawn into an AutoCAD drawing so it's suggesting we use 8666 which I thought I was using 8666 and we're going to export the DXF file it's going to quickly load AutoCAD and while it's doing that in the background I will come back here and I will ask to print a schedule and just say no and no and just say schedule ah, I forgot to license it on the system but you should have the scheduling as well uh, that's unfortunate um, so here's AutoCAD and there's my drawings now what you're going to get is the details for the beams that we did and you're going to end up with all your columns naturally the columns will draw them thinking that they may continue up but up above that is a steel section and then the pad foundations and you'll see the pads as I zoom in and pan this across you'll see that you even have the starter bars so uh, 632s um, are required in this and then they will be in bar mark 80 they will be um, the same as what the column itself is if I was to pan across so there's your RC details all done nice and neatly and very simply in your concrete design and I'm not going to save that so back in let's move forward timber design timber design I have several ways of doing this I can either come and pull in an existing timber truss and I'm sure I had one here that I had done there an attic truss and this is actually quite an interesting attic truss so just analyze it space frame okay it shouldn't have been a space frame analyze it as a plane frame and design timber design so I can see my timber design on my members and I can see the specification of timber and that I had chosen it to be internal in continuous use and we'll then see down here that we also have done in fact a flitched beam in this area here so we're getting our bolt spacing and everything for um, bolts are required along this to work on the flitching of the design so we can do timber glue lamb timber and flitched beams and we can see here we're actually using an 8 by 100 plates either side we could if we really wanted to sort of make it semi uh, hidden if this was a new construct and go for two mem timber pieces with one plate in the middle so we have that ability to try and hide your um, flitching beam so full scope of the timber there and another way interesting one if I just pull in and open another file in here um, where did I put it timber purlin so I created a wee tiny file timber purlin nothing too exciting it is in fact sitting at an angle so when we look at this end on we see it's at an angle and when we go in to analyze as a space frame this time and design as a timber member 
we will be using the combined um, deflections and it will be a combined uh, check on the timber member and that deflection is the serviceability for the vertical and horizontal. So very very powerful, very very usual. Now next thing is portal frames and I see a little question come up on the screen about fire boundaries and that's a very good program uh, question. We have in PowerPad the ability to do bigger f portal frames using the frame analysis that we did previously but we also have um, the ability to do automatic elastoplastic design of portals. So let's go into edit and we will see that we've got two spans of 18 and 12 meters and I have a rise of seven and a half degrees, haunch lengths of one and a half and 1.25 meters. Looks a wee bit chunky, you probably could resize that down and and then the other haunches are quite long, the apex haunches. Columns, we have gone for six meters and then we've gone for six and then step back down by one and then five so we get this five meter high um, dropped portal. So I'm just going to analyze this and go into design. I'm going to do a plastic design and into the physical steel design again and we will see that it's slightly different and the main difference is, is obviously that it can do elastoplastic design and it can ask it to size it and resize the members which I just won't do now for the brevity of everything and then you can look at your elastic critical load factor 15 and above great I do not need to do any P delta analysis. If I did, I could add those in, no problem. Um, sway stability is already assessed. Snap through isn't that important because it's not that type of frame. Fire boundary, yeah, you just choose your three members and then you put in what the roof load during the fire is and the wall load. And I'm going to put point 0.1 on the fire wall and point 0.1 on the roof and we'll see we get a 60 kilonewton overturning moment on that and if you remember that. So that's your steel design. Uh, the last part is the design of the physical members and you can see your appendix BB, it's Eurocode remember, and you're putting your stays at uh, sheeting rail 3 and putting stays nothing is needed it does not need one point of counter fletcher and then in here again because my sections aren't that optimized at this moment in time so coming out of master port but staying with master port we can now go into design our connections And I've already set these up for you again just to save you a bit of time uh, on this webinar. We have a lot to get through and um, we're at half past. So, eaves connections, stiffened, um, very, very simple. Four different loading cases being considered and we will see the capacity here. If we look at the other member, we'll see the opposite over here. We can look at an apex and see our apex connections. We look at our base plates, we'll see our base plate. And remember, we had a fire boundary on this column. So if you look at the loading cases, we now have an additional one called fire boundary case. So as we come down through, the loading cases, one, two, three, four. There we go. We have a problem with the fire boundary. It is failing because of fire boundary. And why are we failing? Again, this blue background tells us it's failing. It is the pull out cones. And we basically need just to increase everything. So if I go and I increase the cones, so concrete, 
I'm going to go for cast in depth of say 300 and it's nearly there make it 350 and we're now satisfactory here but we still have a little problem and it's really to do with the projections and I just need to make the base maybe a wee bit wider so 550 by 300 Oops, sorry. And we should now be seeing everything's now working. We're nearly up there once a wee bit more. So I'm going to make that 575. And everything's now totally happy and works perfectly. And of course, we can just scan and check that that all works. We also have our beam splices. I don't need one but I just did one here just for the fun of it to demonstrate and even column splices. At least I think I had a column splice in here. There we go. Ah, it was in that leg. So I've done a column splice with only internal cover plates and countersunk bolts. So Connections works with portals, but obviously it'll work just as well with the frame analysis uh, as you would expect. Now, that's nearly all of the integrated into master frame program um, aspects of the master series. Where we're now going to go and move to is the standalone programs, because we have about four fantastic little programs that are standalone, uh, including the masonry design. So let's have a wee look at masonry and just take this file. In masonry, again, all the time you're getting real programs, not little pro forma spreadsheets. So if you want to change a value, everything changes instantaneously and you can switch and swap as your heart's desired. So we have a freestanding wall and it's got a 0.74 kilonewton load. If I then move along, I now have a load bearing wall, an internal wall at 140 thick and it is not working. So I'm either going to have to think about far heavier blocks of so 22.5 Newton blocks, happy, 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 or I could think about playing around with my execution classes or I could go and just make the wall 190 thick and it works. So rather than bringing in expensive engineering blocks, we'll just go with a thicker wall. So a load bearing, because it's carrying quite a lot of load per meter run with a quarter of it eccentric from the the existing level. So you have concentric coming from above and then you have eccentric being loaded at this phase. And if it's a precast wall, you might want to just take 50 mil bearing and things like that. So that's your load bearing. We also have laterally loaded panels. In this case, we have also got an additional reload from above. And that can be very beneficial when you have lateral loading because it can prevent the masonry from going into tension and flexing and give you a stronger wall. Uh, it's all available to you. So there's your design and it is working with a 100 and a 102 brick. So if I look at the outer leaf material, clay brick, so even the high absorption bricks are going to work and you can play around and with that. And finally, the fourth type of thing that you can do inside this masonry is columns or piers, whatever way you want to call them. So you can look at doing an extension and putting a couple of beams onto this pier in the middle of um, a wall where you have taken out the wall on either side and left this little column of masonry. And we again have got quite a considerable load and we can see that the wall is actually 
440 by 215 and it is working if I was to reduce these down to 10 Newton blocks it would not work so I do need the stronger 17 and a half Newton um, blocks to make this work so lovely flexibility there and I use exit and won't save that second program very similar interface is the retaining walls so coming along taking my typical retaining wall you have basically about four different types that we can work with you've got your reinforced concrete retaining wall and you'll notice a sloping back and an additional load from wind pressure and then you have your stepped masonry walls unreinforced stepped masonry walls and then thirdly I seem to have the same again and fourthly this is actually technically a gabion wall and the reason it's a gabion wall is because I've got no reinforcement in the wall part and I put my concrete tensile strength to zero if I had any problems with it actually wanting to overturn then I would have to um, I would see a failure so if I went back to my wall and I reduced it such that the first thickness was when it coming down to 200 you'd suddenly see that because of this thinning it's now got an inner steel face tension force and there's nothing to resist this tension so um, that is just how you would do a gabion wall if you so desired coming back to my first one your standard reinforced concrete wall We've quite a few things we can do to this. We can even give it a slope and we could then make it 250. So sloping or even make that 100. So from 300 down to 250, sloping back. Uh, always a desirable thing to do uh, if it's going to be near where people are walking past. Otherwise, to keep thinking the wall's falling over on top of them. Uh, just to, due to that optical illusion, I'm sure you, all you guys know that. Uh, we have the ability to stipulate what the soil height is on the both pressure sides. And that's the wall height, that's the projection. This is your soil, sorry, two, three, four, five. But obviously it'll actually have virtually no effect because it's going to be taken away when you uh, calculate about your um, overdig and you have your basic 10 kilonewton um, surcharge on the wall. And we can play around with internal and even external slopes if we want to. We can make it such that that is sloping down. Water table we can play around with and again move that up and down. So you've got full flexibility. Uh, I've always been a great believer, and it's the way I was taught, that even though you're going to drain the retaining wall, allow for at least 500 of water, just in case the drains aren't working. And during a flash flood, a little bit builds up behind it. Um, so that's your retaining walls. Again, dead, dead easy to use. So what's next? The next program available to you is... composite beams again at an, another standalone program you can buy the full version of any of these programs such as the masonry with its openings and yield, multiple yield line analysis very very fancy um, or the, the smaller version that you saw there in PowerPad in the composite we can um, do the standalone composite in here so what we've got is a secondary beam six meters a span three meters either side let's jig this around and make it 3.8 on the left side so a little bit extra loading uh, 6 kilonewton imposed and we'll actually tell it that it is for office or for storage which will change one or two of the um, load parameters 
and we'll see that the section multi deck 60 we've got all our deck types and the dynamic section we're going to go and I'm going to drop that down to 275 and it fails I can just go back up to 350 and just like in the other steel design and even in the concrete we can auto size by weight order and it will try and find the first section in this case a 305 102 don't like the narrow flanges I prefer the 254 by 146 31 so one kilogram but a more stable to me section uh, at the 150 wide we, we also have areas where we can take out different sections from our groups we can also stipulate here what the minimum height you want is or the maximum so that's my first beam my secondary beam the most popular beam and then I have a primary with a beam in the middle and I will see again if I go to auto design by weight it's given me the 406 by 39 and if we look back you'll see that we're talking about a six meter span with six meters either side because the secondary beams were six meters long so they're now coming into this member and then the final one is the three-part primary beam two loads at uh, third points and we can again see and if I just mess around with this and tell it that it's zero on this side it's now a composite primary edge beam so it only has the loading on one side and that affects obviously the capacity so rather than making it better it's now made it worse and it's one of the reasons why quite frequently you'll see some people will never put um, design their edge beams as composite and it's for this reason because you now have this transverse shear but what can we do about all this we can always ask the auto design but we can also play around with our studs and our reinforcement so that's not helping so I'm gonna go for studs and lax that down to 250 centers for my studs and it now works so I have that full flexibility and you'll notice also I was able to put an additional load on as well as the normal UDL. So that is your composite design ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I want to look at finally is the wizard. The wizard allows me to take calculations that I've created so I'm going to go in and pull in a calculation and here's one I've done on concrete uh, slabs and it's a punching shear check and I'm just going to insert that in to my design and I'm just going to change it such that the axial load that I have is going to be 200 ultimate and I'll see now that it's gone blue and I need to sort my punching my critical is too high around my column head for the slab thickness so actually I would have needed a thicker slab as you can see it's all automatic and I can take that and then I can then send that straight out to my word document and it's just hidden the word document as it's doing the reporting and that should appear back in again what I did leave out was these beam designers so designer suite the simple beam designers come into the concrete beam designer and I can take a typical frame give it a name give it another span of five so six five and I'm going to make this into a cantilever so it's going to be 1.6 and I will just tell it then that the last span is a cantilever and watch the bending moment diagram and there it goes the difference between this and the big frame analysis one is two things one it is a lot more finite in its definition so it's easier to use but it's also what you see is what you get as I change values 
as I decide that on the cantilever end I only want 25 of a load so it's changed it there directly and the moment is changed down to 127 and I want to change the live load down to 10 and it goes up to 83 so it's giving us all those answers automatically and if I go into my design concrete design in the concrete design it will be no different to what we saw previously so there we go our concrete frame design as we saw it previously in this case very lightly loaded and then there's one last program that I always forget to cover and then I will hand over to my colleague Dr Martin O'Gara to just go through any questions and answers that you have and anything that he feels that I should have covered so under element design I actually have this concrete slabs and this is a nice little simple tool and what this allows me to do is for example torsion restrain two-way slabs with a UDL on it or simply support it two-way slab and it will just use the coefficients to work them simple equal span or nearly equal span continuous beam uh, slabs and it will just allow you to put the reinforcement in so you can just come along and change your reinforcement for all the different end span locations and it can even do a simply supported slab very very quickly so I say it is 155 deep and it's 300 wide and it's got four and one so I'm going to now increase the reinforcement to try and make this work and there we go 12s at 200 works so I'm just going to hand over to my colleague Dr Martin O'Gara he will answer all your questions today and I'd like to thank you all for coming along hi everyone it's Martin O'Gara speaking here and I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, session there with Tommy um, I'm just going to take a quick run through some of your questions just before we do that, uh, just to do a quick review on the, the Master Series PowerPad and uh, with regards to the, the content of it, uh, you've got, had a very good idea of what's in that. What we're looking at here is our Master Series, uh, basically current program uh, description list and, and pricing list. And this does do a pretty good job of comparing the, the different versions of PowerPad and what are in each because it's pretty important if you're considering this PowerPad to be able to be very clear in terms of what is included in the PowerPad. PowerPad is a light master series system. Uh, it is a, a, a reduced version of master series provided as a bundle. So you're getting all the core or many of the core fundamental analysis and design packages However, you're getting them for a fraction of the cost, so therefore there is compromise in terms of the, the, the full-blown features that you are missing there. So this does give you a summary of, of what those uh, restrictions are, and it's, I guess it's pretty important that you have an idea of that. The obvious one being the, the likes of the 100 members when you look at the likes of the PowerPad Plus, but there are other things, such as Tommy hit on with regards to the masonry design. Um, you're, you obviously don't get the more powerful fully automated yield line analysis with the opening design and the wind post design but the good news is that every aspect of PowerPad isn't limited to its um, its its position in PowerPad if you like any component of PowerPad can be upgraded to its otherwise full-blown version in fact we've got a very good early upgrade discount scheme so if for instance you purchase the power pad and in a few months time you decide well actually there are a few components of power pad that i really like but i would could do with the full versions of them well you can actually pick any two components of power pad to upgrade to their full price at a 50 percent discount within 60 days of, of purchasing your power pad or at the time of purchasing your power pad you can you can avail of those discounts as well uh, another very important thing is really to have a review uh, of the the add-on. So as I say, any component of PowerPad can be upgraded. Uh, the the costings of that are associated are, are des described here, as well as what you're getting when you upgrade from that PowerPad version to the otherwise full-blown version. 
Uh, as Tommy mentioned, uh, you can request a free trial at any point to give you a full blown 30 day trial of the of the PowerPad uh, for you to, to get a full and proper assessment of that. Um, if we uh, uh, can just spend a few minutes now having a look at your queries, I'll just come back to my master series and come back out to the front screen. Um, we have had a, a number of queries here. Let's just have a look at that. I think one of them Tommy actually covered during the webinar on fire boundary conditions. Um, someone asking, can you do automated wind loading uh, as part of the PowerPad suite? Well, the, the PowerPad uh, at its core uh, uh, shares um, something called the master frame modeling environment. The master frame on its own uh, you get in PowerPad with the member restrictions. Master Frame on its own does not give you the facility for automatic wind load generation. The wind load generation on any of the structures Tommy would have shown you would have been uh, loading that was created. Um, so if we take for instance the likes of his uh, 3D frame that he was looking at or coming into the loading, the loading that was generated would have been entered um, by the engineer on the members and worked out. So for example the, the W1 and the, the W2 wind loads here would have been calculated and entered. Automatic wind loading is a facility of the the more fuller suite which we call our master series building design suite and the very good news is that the master series building design suite um, it very much overlaps with PowerPad. So the great thing about PowerPad is that you're not starting with a, a little light system and then when you outgrow it you have to scrap that and move on to something else. That's not the case at all. You're dealing with a system which can be ex very much extensible and this can grow into uh, the building design suite which gives you the automatic uh, wind load application um, which you get when you start to come into the 3D model menu. You've got wind loading and automated wind loading here and you can see this is these facilities are grayed out because this is a power pad only license. So all of that fully automated wind panel generation with together with site selection and generation of coefficients of pressures it can all be done uh, by upgrading the components of PowerPad to the building design suite modeling environment. Um, someone asking how you deal with pattern loading in, in the, in the, in the, uh, the PowerPad. Again that's that's great that's not a problem at all. Uh, I don't think there's any pattern loading set up in this structure here but one of the things you'll notice is that every time I put a load on uh, a member that load can be associated with a load group. So if I have a 2 kilonewton per meter load here that's going into a load group called uh, dead and load set 1. So we've got a, a letter for the load group and then each load group can go between 0 and 9. Effectively pattern loading is controlled by varying these uh, letters. So for instance if I were to come here and say well this is actually not dead one but dead two and this comes back to dead one and similarly if I had live loads on this here which there doesn't seem to be any at the moment so if we just pop in a live load, live one, let's just make that five kilonewtons per meter and on to the next one then simply I would say that the load here is a live two load and I can make that the same value. And finally, the last one might have a live one load, uh, which it actually already has. Now with these loads split up into the different load groups, I now have full control over how those are combined together in my load combinations. So in my load cases, I do have a number of cases here. Now I'm going to do this manually so you can see how it's done. Uh, but essentially, uh, for instance, in my load combination, because I now have taken some of my loads and put them into the, uh, the, 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 the D2 and L2 cases, I'll need to make sure that they're covered in these cases by entering those factors. If I want to then produce a pattern, so this is, if you like, your all spans loaded case. If I want to then produce a pattern of that, let's add another case. So say I am doing this in, a, in as basic and as manual a fashion as can be done. Uh, there are faster ways of doing this. So I can say dead plus live uh, and I can give that a name pattern 1 and um, we'll call that an ultimate case. These are just quick typing buttons that you see here. And then over here simply again as I say I'm doing this manually. Let's go for, for a fully factored D1 and L1 
uh, but then with the the other cases we'll go for uh, factored D2 and then nothing in the L2 and that essentially will produce a loading case where I've got maximum minimum maximum and likewise I can create a, an 18th loading case which has the reverse of that where I've got minimum maximum minimum um, the great news is that anytime you spend creating these cases uh, you can reuse that again and again because essentially in the loading cases one can import cases from another job so if I've spent time setting up my pattern cases here I can import these cases from another master series data file or import cases from a standard loading case uh, library of loading cases by coming down here I have some of these loading cases already saved under this little quick selector drop list which I can add to at any point but I've got some ones here which seem to be specific to, to the British standard uh, they'll automatically get converted to, to the Eurocode loading cases because it will recognize that uh, they need to undergo that conversion but there are two ways that you can quickly grab existing cases or cases from another file or cases that you previously saved into this little mini library uh, to speed up that process of generating those cases okay so that's the pattern loading um, somebody asking how do you set up a Gabion wall uh, so I'm just going to come back out of the analysis area into the retaining walls and hopefully we'll, I'll be able to find the uh, retaining wall that, that has the Gabion example that uh, Tommy looked at okay uh, if we go to the last one a couple of things you can see here first of all in the reinforcement that the wall interface and outer face reinforcement has been turned off so it's an unreinforced concrete wall the second thing was the tensile strength is set to zero because Gabians typically don't have any tensile strength given that they're loosely uh, packed stone in cages and then also in the wall data tab the top of the wall thickness is the top thickness of the top of the Gabian and the the base actually doesn't really matter it's a fairly minimal um, uh, just at 200 millimeters it, it has little or no significance given that the wall covers the full width of the base but it is, would be prudent to set the overall width of the base to be the overall width at the bottom of of the wall itself uh, so you can control that by your your projections on either side and things like that so you can come down basically then and to produce the stepping we can input a number of different values here for the stepping and really how that reads is that you put a vertical step then a horizontal step then a vertical step so the 500 is the step down the 200 is the step out the 500 is the next step down so in fact if I were to put in here another 200 and another say 100 you can see that how that works now I'm stepping out another 200 down another 100 and then that just simply finishes out the the stepping arrangement and the steps can be done on both sides I'm doing this here on the inside only and, and the outside remains straight so I can step actually on both sides if I if I need to do that great back to your questions um, how do you design a masonry shear wall with the master series suite well in the masonry design program there are inputs for uh, for lateral shear load the question really is is that something that's part of the of the power pad uh, range of programs so if we come in here to the uh, the lateral loading yeah we can see in here we've got a QZ force that we can put in and an in-plane moment as well so that will design the in-plane shear and the in-plane overturning or bending moment in the in the in-plane aspect of the wall so that's certainly covered there with that uh, fire boundary how do the forces get passed to the pad foundation design well effectively the the fire boundary is a special case that's part of the mass report not, uh, not so much the general master frame but the the this specific master port so in the uh, not the editing environment but at the design end so let's uh, just exit the editor and go into the design and in the um, and where we look at our fire boundary the uh, you've got a very much a, a, a strategic way and a, a flowed way of looking at retaining wall design I should say and that um, members are assigned to groups 
uh, so so that members can be part of groups and and s such as the set of rafters are the same group. Uh, each of the columns are individual because they're all unique in terms of their um, their circumstances. Uh, then you've got your automated design. Once you've set up those groups, you can specify the parameters of your design and and, and tell it to go for it. Then you've got your detailed design, which uh, dictates the. Uh, oh, sorry, not the detailed design, but the the the. Once you've established your section sizes with through the automatic design, or you can manually specify your section sizes. It doesn't have to be automated. Uh, you can then s uh, ascertain or spe uh, your your things like your your critical load, uh, elastic critical buckling factors, and all the other things you might want to look at before you go finally go through and do a detailed design of where the purlins and side rails and and. Uh, 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 knee braces and things like that are going to go. So back to this phase, which is why this is the logic of, of this ordered progression here. So into the fire boundary and simply the, the fire boundary set up by saying it, it we're creating a boundary out of members one, two and f uh, five being the column, one and two being the rafters and it, it calculates that. Tommy's already showed you that but where that gets pulled through to the pad foundation design is purely automatic. When we go into the uh, say the connection design or the pad foundation design, uh, basically you'll notice that there is a fire boundary case uh, coming through into the as one of the cases in the design. So it's basically automated, um, and the same thing too with the the fire boundary case in the base plate design. It'll come through as an additional loading case over and above your your standard cases you set up for analysis purposes. Uh, what's the best way to analyze and design a steel cranked beam with power pad? Well, as you know, the master frame engine gives you the ability to set up whatever geometry you require for uh, for analysis purposes. So if I were wanting to create a crank, um, not to go through this in overly complex detail, otherwise we'll be here all day, uh, we, we can st simply start drawing in that crank. Uh, we can I can do all sorts of things like type 5 meters at 20 degrees and start typing there to get in uh, things that I want uh, but if I were to draw in a crank um, and obviously put appropriate restraints on either side of that and so on and so forth uh, we've got some section properties there the w I guess the the issue here really is that you've got two separate members and not just one member uh, for design purposes. Now essentially um, what we would normally do if we had a straight member with a, a point in the middle is that would automatically become something called a super member. Two anal analytical members on a straight line can be joined together as a super member definition so when that member is designed it designs the whole section and not just one analytical subcomponent of it. Uh, you can't create a super member out of a cranked beam so essentially what will happen here now if I put some loads on this here and then go through to the design which I'm not going to take the time to do but essentially you'll end up with a, a, a design check on this part and then a separate design check on this part. Uh, that might be fine in terms of if, if you have a restraint point here for instance uh, then that, that's not an issue in that uh, that cranked part uh, has restraint at, th at this location so the effective lengths are appropriate however if this were one whole section and with no intermediate restraint at the crank point then you'd be advised when you get to design when you're designing this component that you perhaps review your uh, you can manually override the uh, the effective lengths at the design stage so you can input for instance a, a, a longer LX value or a longer LY value uh, also in terms of lateral torsional buckling you can increase your your factor your effective length factor uh, so that it will deal with um, now obviously the lateral torsional buckling of a cranked beam is something that's entirely different from that of a straight beam uh, but the, which that's something the program doesn't cover the lateral torsional buckling of a non straight member at present um, but you, you, you potentially would want to just take that under consideration in terms of when it's doing the lateral torsional buckling on this that it's actually just the buckling of this effective length as if it were restrained at these locations. You may be satisfied with choosing an increased effective length factor so you could start uh, going from an effective length factor of 1.0 to say 1.4 or whatever else you specify. 
However, uh, bear in mind that that lateral torsional buckling of this cranked beam um, it will be somewhat different than that of a straight beam, which the program does not cover. Um, okay, moving on down through your questions. Right, somebody asking about the fill material of the gabel wall. Uh, no tensile stress being able to be developed at this step in the basket interface. Well, essentially there is no tension. It's all based on um, in the Gabion wall, you specify the tension of the concrete being zero. So effectively, uh, that ensures that there's enough, uh, the design will ensure that there's enough gravity load there to prevent any tension from occurring due to the bending. Great. Uh, somebody asking, for the connection design module and power pad, does it do a simple and moment connection? Yes, that's correct. You get both simple and moment connection modules as part of the of the power pad. They are two separate purchasable modules, but you get both of those in power pad with some of the force restrictions that I'm sure Tommy has outlined for you there. Okay, somebody else saying building design suite is excellent. Thank you very much, that's great. And also a very helpful event today. Well, thank you again for your comments there. That l wraps up our questions, ladies and gentlemen. Just remains for me to say, thank you very much for your time here today. Uh, if you've got any questions whatsoever, please do get in touch with us. You can email Tommy at masterseries.com uh, or, or straight through to help at masterseries.com. Great. Thanks very much.